presented this resolution and it gained the majority of this resolution and uh, we obtained the result that China come back to his legitimate seat in the nation and the Security Council. People's Republic of China celebrates the 50th anniversary since its return to the United Nations. But how did it get there? Join me for an exclusive interview with the Algerian ambassador to China for some untold stories. From CGTN headquarters in Beijing, this is The Hub with Wang Guan. Hi there, and a very warm welcome to The Hub. I'm Wang Guan in Beijing. If you think today's great power politics is bad, think about global politics half a century ago. It's a lot worse. People's Republic of China, or so-called Red China, was founded in 1949 after a bloody civil war, but it wasn't until 21 years later when the UN recognized Beijing, the de facto government of China, over Taipei, a dissident minority regime set up by the Nationalist Party as the sole legitimate government of China. Why? It's politics. Now, recently, I caught up with one person who knows this part of history all too well, the Algerian ambassador to China, Mr. Alcine Buhalfa. It was his country, along with Albania, who played a leading role in helping PRC regain its UN membership. Ambassador Alcine Buhalfa, Algerian ambassador to China, thank you so much for this opportunity and welcome to the hub on CGTN. Thank you. Thank you for receiving me in this uh important show and uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak uh, with the Chinese people and also the others who are uh, watching this program. Ambassador Buhalfa, in July 1971, Algeria, Albania were leading a group of 21 other UN member states in proposing the resolution 2758 that helped People's Republic of China regain its seat at the United Nations. Now you're the Algerian ambassador to China. Looking back at that decision, 50 years on, what are your thoughts on that? My first thought is uh, we are in Algeria and as ambassador of Algeria, we are very proud about uh, this uh, the resolution. And uh, I think we take or we took in that time a strategic decision. Uh, when you see what China is doing in the United Nations, and the, the contribution of uh, China as a country uh, in the work of the United Nations is very important. And now China is the first contributor to the budget, or the second contributor to the budget of the United Nations, but also the first contributor in uh, Peace Corps. And uh, the contribution of China in, I think, 25 or 26 operation of peace around the world is very important for the work of the United Nations. The main purpose or the main objective or the main mission of the United Nations is to establish the peace in the world. Even many times the United Nations failed in that mission, but many of countries and especially China are contributing on those operations of peace and now China is the first contributor on that. Uh, second, uh, China is promoting the multilateralism and uh, also the main objective of, or one of the main objectives of the United Nations is the promotion and the development of multilateralism because the, the cooperation between countries, the cooperation between us is very important. There is no country who can uh, manage his own uh, development alone without the cooperation with the other countries. And uh, China is uh, the first promoter of uh, this concept of multilateralism. This, uh, this is what uh, I am thinking now. We took in 71 a strategic decision. We work with uh, the other countries to promote uh, the resolution 2758 and we succeed to obtain the majority for this uh, resolution in September. Uh, I had also to say for the history that uh, this work or this uh, resolution was prepared by my country and by China. We have to remember in July 71, uh, the foreign minister of Algeria, the former president Abdelaziz Bouteflika, he visited China in July 71. He uh, was here, I think, six or seven days working with Chinese authorities. He met in that time the Prime Minister Chuan Lai to prepare this uh, resolution. And with this preparation and uh, with the, 
the cooperation of the other countries, we presented this uh, resolution and it gained the majority of this resolution and uh, we obtained the result that China come back to his legitimate seat in the United Nations and the Security Council. But Ambassador Bahalfa, we know that that was during the height of the Cold War. Uh, a lot of geopolitics going on, power politics going on. Uh, a month after the resolution 2758, there were two other resolutions brought up by the United States and Saudi Arabia, basically saying that um, the United Nations should keep both the People's Republic of China and the so-called Republic of China on Taiwan, uh, creating a, a two-China scenario. Algeria opposed that proposal. Why? As, as I told you, we believe on one China and one Chinese people. And uh, first, uh, second, we prepare uh, uh, the resolution and uh, in the preparation, Chinese authorities, they told us, they told in that time for the foreign minister that they will be opposed in that, in that, uh, for that idea to divide or to create two China. It's not possible. It wasn't possible and it is not possible now. This is uh, the idea. There is only one Chinese people, there is only one China, and this is our credo. And I think all the countries working and ha having a relation with China now, they are working on that base. Back then, there were a lot of arguments about how to help PRC regain its seat at the United Nations. Um, for example, some say helping PRC regain its seat would involve uh, getting rid of ROC. Um, but Algeria's representative in the United Nations said this. He said, the eviction of a member, um, it's not the eviction of a member, but the eviction of the representatives of a dissident minority regime. Um, why did the Algerian representative come up with that characterization? Yes, because this is uh, what we believe in Algeria, uh, first. Uh, and uh, second, uh, we're upset about uh, this division of the world uh, uh, to Korea, in that time to Germany and to China. How, why you are dividing peoples? For ideological reason, and this is why we strongly oppose the idea to divide China or to create to China, and this is why uh, in that time our ambassador, the ambassador Rahal, he made uh, this statement in favor of one China, and we succeed on that. This is the result. This is the main objective that we succeed on our work in cooperation with the other countries, but especially with the Chinese authorities. Uh, 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 that means when you prepare something, when you work together, when you coordinate our position, we can succeed. Uh, this is the main idea. Why Algeria is uh, beside the Chinese people? We have uh, to remember the history. Chinese uh, authorities in 1958, they took the decision to recognize the provisional Algerian government in that time. In that time, Algerians were struggling for their independence. And uh, they recognized the provisional uh, governments of Algerian Republic. And after, they established diplomatic relations with this provisional government. The first non-Arab country to do so, right? The first non-Arab country to do that. And also, it was unique in international relations. That's uh, when sovereign state to establish diplomatic relations with the liberation movement. In that time, it was liberation movement. It was also the provisional government. But we were struggling. We were not independent. We established four year, the diplomatic relations four years before our independence. In first. 1962. And our independence yes, arrived in 1962. In 1962, we established a formal diplomatic relation. We exchanged ambassadors. And uh, in 1963, we received a visit of the prime minister, Chu Enlai. And in that time also China took the decision to send the first medical Chinese team to another country. It was sent to my country. This is uh, the history, the history between the two people. This is the base of our cooperation and this is our, the base of our, our friendship. As we never forget the help and the support given by the Chinese people and the Chinese authorities, uh, headed by Chairman Mao and the Prime Minister Xu Enlai in that time, I think Chinese also, they don't forget what we made in 71. But this is the two 
important dates on our relation. But we establish from that time to now a strong partnership. Algeria was also the first Arab country to establish a comprehensive strategic partnership with China in 2014. And uh, China now is our first partner, the, our first economic and commercial partner in the world. And we are building step by step a strong partnership for the benefits of our two people. I can see uh, certainly there were a lot of the emotion when you talk about uh, mm -hmm. uh, China Algeria relationship, uh, especially the history of the bilateral relations. Mm -hmm. We know that your six year tenure as the Algerian ambassador to China mm -hmm. is coming to an end. Mm -hmm. um, Looking back, what will be the memories of China that you are taking back to Algeria when you finish this tenure? Looking back, the how Chinese are building their country, how they are serious in their work, how they are uh, following uh, uh, the same line to make China stronger and stronger and developed country. This is, I think, the main idea. But also at the same time, the diversity of Chinese people. I visited uh, some of the provinces of, around China. And uh, every time I am surprised by the difference with the other province. But at the same time, it's the same people, the same country, with this uh, variety of uh, culture, variety of music, variety even of cuisine, uh, tradition. That's it's the same country, the same people working uh, together to make uh, this country better and better. This is, I think, the main idea. That's also the same, also that uh, how Chinese, uh, they are thinking uh, about the other countries, how they are uh, uh, working with the other countries uh, to share with them a kind of prosperity. Uh, this. Uh, uh, kind of economic development, China and African countries. We created the, the China Africa Forum two, 21 years ago, and we can see the result how this forum made to the African countries. At the same time, also in 2004, or China and Arab countries, we created the, the Arab China Forum, and also there is a big result in this forum, and we are working together, Arab countries and China, to organize next year the first summit for this forum. That shows that the forum is giving important results in our cooperation and also arrive the moment that we have to meet at the summit to give an impulse to this cooperation between Arab countries and China. I think it's fair to say that China has been uh, very grateful for uh, Algeria in uh, leading uh, 22 other countries. Um, you know, in helping China regain its seat in the United Nations. Now, it has been 50 years since that historic resolution been passed. How would you describe the role of China uh, within the United Nations system? As I said at the beginning of uh, this uh, show or this uh, program, we are proud uh, by this uh, strategic decision because uh, when we see uh, what China is making inside the United Nations as a contribution uh, in uh, peace process or in peace operation, as a contribution in many United Nations organizations for Chinese leading uh, international organizations inside the United system, United Nations system, it's very important. And uh, China uh, is promoting uh, the cooperation between countries, promoting multilateralism, and this is important for the work of the United Nations. It's uh, important for the international community. We have to work together first to protect uh, our planet. Now. No, no one oh, can ignore that uh, uh, our planet is uh, in kind of danger of this climate change. We have to work to safeguard uh, this planet for the next generation. Uh, we have uh, to work also for the other streets, uh, like pandemia, like uh, natural uh, uh, catastrophe uh, around the world. This is uh, uh, why uh, you are thinking that China is an important uh, uh, country for the 
United Nations system, and uh, in the same time, China is one third of the population of the world. <laughs> you cannot ignore this uh, uh, figure or uh, this important uh, item. Uh, and uh, as I told you, we are very proud about this, uh, that decision, and we are also very proud about what uh, China is making inside the inter United Nations uh, system and inside the international community. But over the years, Ambassador, you know this better than I do, there have been questions about China's ambition and China's role in the international community, saying that China is exporting its so-called authoritarian model of government, its state-led economic growth model, uh, and trying to make the United Nations according to its own image. How would you respond to those criticisms? It, it is not our feeling. It is not our feeling. Uh, especially in Algeria now. I, uh, the cooperation with China is on the equal base. Uh, we are partner. Uh, we are working uh, together uh, for uh, the development of our economy and uh, uh, at the benefits of the Chinese companies and also in the same time the benefits of the Algerian people. Uh, we don't feel that China is uh, uh, asking or making or putting condition for their cooperation or their support. Each country has to choose his own way to develop uh, his, uh, the economy, uh, to be a developed country. We don't have the feeling that we are seeing, uh, or maybe uh, some uh, journalists in some part of the world and uh, some uh, observers on some commentator, political commentator, are making these comments, maybe because China now is uh, a big country, a powerful country. The Chinese people, they succeed to develop their economy, but uh, uh, when you work day after day with the Chinese, with Chinese authorities, you don't feel that uh, there is any other ambition only to cooperate together and uh, to work together for the benefits of our two people. Ambassador Asim Buhalfa, uh, thank you so much. Uh, we know that uh, China is probably not the end of your decorated diplomatic career, and thank you for your service. Thank you for giving us the opportunity for talking to you. Thank you, thank you for receiving me and uh, the Chinese people for receiving me here during uh, this uh, period. I worked uh, uh, with uh, many Chinese and I uh, have to thank the Chinese authority for their support, for their help. Uh, they gave me during my mission here and uh, I hope uh, all the success for the Chinese uh, people for the future. Welcome back. For more on China, the United Nations and global politics, I'm joined by Dr. Torsten Jelinek in Berlin, Germany. He's the Senior Fellow and Europe Director of Taihe Institute. Torsten, welcome to The Hub on CGTN. Juan, thank you for having me on your show. It's a great pleasure. So what do you make of the fact that it took the United Nations 21 years to recognize the People's Republic of China and for you know, the CPC-led PRC to regain its UN membership? So, uh, first of all, congratulations um, to China uh, on this 50th anniversary. So, uh, I mean, we were in the midst of the Cold War, uh, which maybe explains why it took so long to have China PRC uh, accepted as the rightful member. Uh, and uh, it was also a sign that actually the UN had failed to prevent the Cold War from happening, right? And as we were in the Cold War, the United States tried everything not to let the PRC in and to, to keep uh, Taiwan, the Republic of China, uh, as the member representing China, you know, as the central government of China. So, uh, so and, and the United States and its allies were successful over the years, and China tried every year to become a member. Uh, and, uh, but uh, eventually, uh, eventually, with the help of Albania, uh, China could uh, get the majority and uh, uh, got the place in, in the United Nations. So, but having said that, China was also reserved uh, in a way. You know, it didn't see the United States, uh, the United Nation, as a, let's say, a sacred space. Uh, it was rather strongly influenced by the United States. So that was always a criticism. Um, uh, by, by the People's Republic of China. So, but eventually, like in 1971, China was accepted. So I think that's the, the, the background here. Yeah, you know, 
In uh, August 1971, the United States proposed another resolution, a competing resolution, basically proposing a, a two China scenario where uh, Washington says, why don't we do this, folks? Why don't we keep the ROC membership uh, and at the same time uh, accept the PRC as a new member, uh, basically creating this two China um, situation? Uh, why do you think the United Nations did not go down that path? Well, uh, well the United States actually proposed a supermajority here, like two thirds of the vote. Uh, wanted to prevent PRC to become a member. So, and that maybe uh, was a big hurdle. But uh, on the other hand, there was a big group of members, member countries, uh, which recognized China and uh, helped China uh, to become a member. And uh, what this group also recognized that uh, in order to, to justify, uh, that means that Taiwan, the ROC was a member and in fact they argued they were not a member at all over the whole years so uh, so uh, and actually there is one resolution at the United Sa at the United Nations which says that Taiwan actually is a province of China and not a sovereign country so as it is not a sovereign country it was de facto or de jure never a member so in that way China could uh, PRC could basically get the vote but it's also why did the the, uh, why, why, why this was not accepted is also a sign that the United States over the past 20 years or so lost relative power. So it was very powerful when it set up the United Nations with also the help of the UK. Uh, but, uh, you know, 20 years later, uh, uh, the power uh, declined, relatively speaking. So, and that was the right moment and uh, for China to basically than the PRC to represent China. So in that way, it's a legal and rightful place back into the global system of international relations. So Torsten, you're from Germany, you're a citizen of Germany, and you once faced a divided country, uh, just like today's China, uh, the reunification of the Chinese mainland and Taiwan. So talk to us about how, in your opinion, the unification of East Germany with West Germany, in what ways can that reunification inform and perhaps enlighten uh, the uh, often sensitive but hopefully eventual reunification of the Chinese mainland and Taiwan? Well, thank you for that question. It's a pretty personal question. As I grew up in West Berlin, and, uh, and my relatives were in East Berlin, so when the wall came down, in 89, uh, I went to the, with friends, went to the wall, to the Brandenburg Gate and uh, experienced the joy and uh, the happiness. Of course, uh, even today, there's a lot of work uh, to close that, the difference gap between both sides. But overall, that was the, the, the goal of uh, Germany to reunite. And, uh, and I can very much understand that this is the goal of China, in, in a broader sense, to reunite uh, in that respect. So, uh, so, and there are similarities between both countries um, to explain maybe a certain direction. Uh, both countries were latecomers into the international interaction, uh, what was dominated by the United Kingdom and the United States in the past century. Both were looking actually for the rightful place in this new world, right? Uh, because they were late. Uh, and after the Second World War, both were divided. Both came out divided of that situation. But here, China, but here Germany integrated into you know, that new history, into the dominant structure which was led by the United States, and China kind of kept on, kept on uh, being isolated. But having said that, the question of China's reunification has a strong post-colonial, post-imperial uh, imperial, uh, imperial element, so, uh, because uh, Western forces uh, dominated uh, China, Asia as we know, and after the Second World War, uh, Taiwan was occupied. There was actually no way, natural way, if you wish, uh, uh, of an early reunification. And uh, that situation was, uh, was very different in, uh, in Germany. Having said that, I think uh, a peaceful reunification should be the goal 
uh, and that happened in Germany, right? That was a, it was a silent revolution on the eastern side. So it, the history provided the right moment, and history must provide the mo right moment also for China to reunite. Finally, Torsten, it has been 50 years since PRC uh, regained this UN membership. How do you look at China's role in the United Nations system and China's contribution to multilateralism? Well, China is, uh, is in and now today an integral part of the United Nations, and uh, it uh, has sent over 50,000 uh, peacekeepers to UN peacekeeping missions. It's the second largest contributor. And uh, so, so and, and on, on the other hand, there's no country, uh, not China, not the United States, not the European Union region, um, which can set up an intergovernmental organization like the UN with 193 member states. So if we, if, we, if we think of that in this way, we have actually a balance. So no country can really, you know, overrule that these days. So we, we have to work on that balance. And I think here, China also stands for a new multilateral system, a reform of the multilateral system, because obviously China has its own track into the modern world, uh, has its own history, uh, and that, um, and that uh, needs to be recognized. So here uh, China is, I think, doing uh, best in the past 50 years have shown a tremendous development of China as we know and as we see it and uh, and I understand that China also thrives on the multilateral system and in fact like the European Union they, they both thrive on that. Dr. Torsten Jelinek, Europe Director of Taihe Institute, thank you so much for joining us here on The Hub. And that will do it for this edition of The Hub. If you have any comments or suggestions about our show, feel free to contact me on social media. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you for joining us. I'm Wang Guan in Beijing. Stay tuned for CGTN. Bye for now.